are pushing through another massive spending plan, $3.5 trillion. So here's the deal. If you're freaked out about the impact this additional spending is going to have on already high inflation, then protect your savings now. Diversify a portion of your savings into gold and silver with Birch Gold. If you haven't reached out to Birch Gold to diversify part of your IRA or 401k into a precious metals IRA, do it today. Text COAST to 989898 and get a free info kit on protecting your savings with gold. Or just buy gold or silver and have it shipped to your home. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the BBB, countless five-star reviews. Talk to them. Have them help you safeguard your investment. Simply text COAST to 989898 to claim your free, no-obligation info kit on holding gold and silver in a tax-sheltered account. Again, text COAST to 989898 to take the first step in protecting your savings today. Baby said like crazy. Our hairballs have hairballs. Our cat mama. Yeah, he's dandruff and an oily coat. D-I-N-O-B-I-T-E. I was thrilled when I heard Dynavite for cats to come out. You want to cats as much as I do. You want to do what's best for them. Dynavite is a life changer. Lately, she's been a lot more playful, a lot more energetic, more active. Dynavite for life. You won't be now. Happy your cat.
There's a lot of confusion about how to protect yourself from COVID, with guidelines and regulations changing by the week. One thing is certain, you need an accurate thermometer for your family to check for fever. The leading sign of flu and COVID, only the Exogen Temple Scanner Thermometer has been proven accurate in more than 100 clinical studies. Don't rely on non-contact thermometers. They have no scientific studies behind them and can miss the fever that might mean COVID. Learn more at exogen.com. We're talking with Daniel Class about uh, a home he owns, the Hinsdale House, reputedly the most haunted house in New York, uh, built in 1853. Daniel, you mentioned the, the rumors, really, about the original owners being a couple of stagecoach robbers who may have killed and buried the victims in the backyard. You haven't confirmed that yourself yet, but you have plans to get to it. What else happened in the history of the house that might explain why it might be haunted? Well, I mean, there's... Native American burial grounds on the property when I was digging uh, these septic to think about some artifacts in the ground, arrowheads. Um, so, I mean, that says to me that there's definitely a, a native, you know, energy to the property as well. I mean, it was their property to begin with anyway, but I mean, it very well could have just been there. But it, to me, it was a house sit. It sits by a water source and it's on top of the hill. It would have been to me. I'm thinking about a tribe where they want to plot their, you know, plot down, and that would be perfect for vision because they can oversee everything, you know. What tribe would that have been? You know? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a run, just dating back, you know, they, they all blurred each other, but I think they were called the Runway, the Runway Tribe, and uh, they eventually got absorbed by the Seneca. So, so um, has it always fun. had. Has it always had these kind of phenomena, as far as you know, tracing back to history? Yeah, I mean, I, I even got to go, you know, I've, I've flown to Florence, Oregon, and actually spoke with the, the mother, Clara Sandy, the Miller, who lived there in the company that had all the phenomena happening to them when they moved in. And just to be able to hear it from her own mouth and, and, and really kind of live it through her eyes, just to, just to understand what they went through, just it's heartbreaking, you know, just to know that they lost all their life savings trying to purchase this home and lost it within four years. And Walk us through it. What, what, so, it. So they got their life savings, bought the home. What starts happening? Well, uh, poltergeist like activity in the house, you know, little things. Um, nothing, you know, like that's too crazy. But then the, the daughter, one of their daughters starts getting affected, starts getting scratches, starts getting uh, uh, marks on her body. Uh, their son Michael is having um, think games fly, fly off the shelf. They're seeing spirits on the outside of the house. Women, a uh, woman in white dancing around the pond. Um, a, a black shadow man in the forest in the front of the house. That's what I always and they're also hearing chanting. They're also hearing like voices coming from the forest. They're, they saw a creature that they couldn't explain what it was in the back of their house. They're looking. Imagine this. Imagine just like sitting in your living room and you look out your window and you see a guy in your backyard. You run up to your backyard and try to confront the guy or see what he's doing in your backyard and nobody's there and you look in your window in your living room and he's inside your house. Stuff like that was happening to them while they were there. Um, they had um, ashtrays flying off the shelves. Uh, their cupboards were flying open. Gas, the gas was being turned on on the stove. So dangerous. It was, getting, it was getting kind of dangerous for them. And, Did anyone uh, get physically harmed? Sure. Yeah, so they were getting physically harmed. Other than the scratches? Uh, yeah, I mean, besides the mental abuse and the, and the, I mean, the one, the one, there's a brick thrown at the one girl. Hmm. And so, so 1974, when I read, there was an exorcism approved by the church. I mean, that's hard to get that uh, approved by the church, I would think. Yeah, I mean, she was consulting with this priest. His name was Father Alfonso Trebolt, and he was, uh, you know, researching him. He was really big into the occult, and uh, she was going back and forth with him. He actually came to the house and performed a mass there in the kitchen first, um, and it, it died down for a little bit, but then it came back full force to the point where they, you know, got an approval to do the structural exorcism 
uh, of the location, and they brought in a film crew to document it, because this is new, this is, you know, this is something that didn't happen, this is before the movie The Exorcist even came out. And uh, documented it, they brought in a psychic, his name was Alex Tannis, and uh, just exercised the location, everybody knelt down in their living room, and as they were filming this, they said the whole house shook, and it was like cleared within 20 seconds. And then, you know, they, they left. They gave the family kind of like things that they could do to try to keep it positive. And it came back again. And then it, it got to the point where he said, you know, I, said, There's not, I don't know what else I can do. You know, like, you should leave. And he left. They had to leave. And he couldn't stay there because of the safety of the, the, the safety of their family. So they moved out four years after moving in and just left it. Yes, they, they left it and hightailed it all the way to California, as far away back as it uh, to go. Uh, you said that the psychic came in as part of the helping with the exorcism. Uh, did the psychic reveal anything about what he was picking up? He was picking up, yeah, I mean, he, he picked up some things that, you know, uh, about a hanging tree that was on the property. He thought maybe that had something to do with it. Um, I did confirm with the town of Kingsdale that the tree that was sitting down the road on the original part of the property is the tree that was used for hanging. And this tree was hit by lightning in 2003. Just over in a ditch there, we've had numerous investigations in this area. And the, the, the dead wood, the dead wood is actually shooting off electromagnetic frequencies. And there's no explanation for it whatsoever. It's, 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 it's just weird. It's just so weird. Uh, to, to be able to you know, research and put data down that there's EMS coming from a dead tree. <laughs> Who was the next uh, next uh, occupant? How how long was it vacant before somebody else moved in? Um, I I just got the you know I, I just bought the house so it basically what it was is a landing. So they were leasing the house. So the data is not available who lived there after. What happened was is I, I had a the show called Paranormal Lockdown film there with Nick Raw. And once that hit TV, people started coming out of the woodwork saying, you know, I lived here. I, you know, I had similar experiences here. This one family that moved in there in the late 70s, they uh, basically were there for less than a month because we were there. We, and we, basically what they had to do is they were having all that same stuff happen. They were having, you know, they were having things thrown up in the house. The uh, windows were getting ripped open. So they were scared for their life. And uh, they hightailed it out of there. Within a month, they broke their lease, left all their stuff in the house. So they didn't want what was there. They they were leaving. And uh, just kind of started over fresh again. So that's what was happening with this place. It's like going back to the owner and uh, uh, to the, the, the Reese Tree Farm that owned the property. And nobody could buy it because everybody that went in there ended up leaving. All the way to 86 cents, that dormant. And then that's when I came in. And you bought it in 2015? Yeah. So it was empty for a while then. Yeah. And not in very good shape. No, no, it was in <laughs> horrible shape. And I could understand why they wanted to tear it down. Is it the kind of place that the, the local kids, teenagers would, uh, you know, or run by it and, and uh, dare people to go up to the door or take dates there to scare them or uh, was it did people tend to stay away from it no that was definitely the place i mean part of the biggest problem with, with me when i bought it and it was people breaking in they were breaking in because of the folklore and the history of the house because they wanted to see it for themselves but like you said they you, you could tell they were children or kids breaking in because they were like making pentagrams on the on the floor with with mustard and, and things like that, you know. And uh, I've had kids that broke in that told me they broke in now that that come back and can come and check the place out and they say that they were in there and when they were upstairs a chair flew at them and that's why they left and they never came back. So there was a book written about it in 2000, and then you've written a book about it. And since your book came out, as well as TV coverage that we'll talk about, uh, more people come out of the woodwork, so to speak, and share their stories. Correct. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, for instance, I, I had another couple of uh, uh, gentlemen and lady that came out, verified that they lived there. Um, he, uh, it was winter, and he was taking his snowmobile out there and he thought the pond was frozen 
put the snowmobile out onto the pond, cracked through the ice until he had to run back to the house to get his uncle. They pulled the snowmobile out of the pond, and when they turned around, he said they saw a man, a woman, and a child levitating over the pond and then dissipate. I mean, just real creepy stuff, you know, like, and, you know, that would, that would scare a family back then. You, know, you, you the, the Danny family that lived there in the 70s, they got ridiculed. You know, they had people barging in their house, breaking in their house, saying, I want to see a ghost. You know, and, and it was all taboo back then. You know, it, was, it wasn't something we really talked about. It, if it wasn't angels, it was demons. That's what it was deemed back then. It was just demons in their house. Did uh, any of the residents who lived there say that something followed them? Did any of them have something that came along that was attached to them? I've had a couple occasions uh, since I've owned it where uh, people have stated that something has followed them home, um, where we'd have, we'd have to like bring in somebody to do a cleansing at their house and cleanse them um, because they didn't kind of ground themselves or do what they were supposed to do when they came to the location. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's been a couple times, it, it's really weird, like this one, the, the one time that Nick Ross was there, something followed him home. Something, something actually followed him home from that location when he filmed there and did his show there. And uh, the night that he did his cleansing, I wasn't aware of what was going on with him and his family. He hadn't told me about it. And uh, the night that he had cleansed his house and cleansed himself, um, I was doing a spirit box session in the living room of the, of the location, and this dark voice came through on the box. It was clear as day, and I, and I kept saying, you know, well, where's Nick? Where's Nick? You know, it kept, it kept repeating itself to the point where I could actually record it, and I sent him the recording. It was in like two minutes, he called me, and he was like, you're not going to believe what I just, you know, we just did at my house. It, it was crazy, you know, um, to, to be able to, because it, it felt lighter after he left. You know, it like felt, it felt different. And then it was like it got shoved back to the location maybe after they did the, the cleansing at his house. What other kinds of sort of physical evidence do you have or been able to accumulate since you've owned it? You mentioned about EVP or ghost box, but EVP work and um, any kind of photos or video or anything? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, we've accumulated so many sick uh, fo photos of uh, full-bodied apparitions in the house, shadow figures, full-figured activity <laughs> through the videos. One of my main goals was to be able to broadcast the location out to everybody, you know, like everybody to watch it. Kind of like watching, a, you know, setting up a DVR system when you go to do a, uh, an investigation. Um, <clears throat> I set up a DVR system there that was a live streaming camera that were IR and started broadcasting them on paranormalwarehouse.com. And uh, the, the first night, the first night that I was able to broadcast every when I bought the location, no, no internet, no nothing. I had to get a satellite internet service put in. And uh, we were able to stream at night. And that night, um, I was online, and we had probably a couple thousand people watching, you know, the live stream. And, you know, I was answering questions about the house, and then passed out on the couch. And then my phone started blowing up. It just, like, started, like, seeing me, you know, it just woke me up. I started looking, at everybody sending me screenshots. I'm looking, and I'm like, holy cow. First night, we had a shadow figure you know, right on right on camera, go right from the door in the kitchen into the one bedroom. And everybody saw it. You know, it was like holy grail on the first night of streaming it. Um, <clears throat> so many so many pictures we got we got them up on our Facebook page if people want to check them out under evidence under the Indale House Restoration Project. Um, they they can go look at all the pictures that we've captured. I've been I've been back basically documenting all this stuff for for since 2015 at this house. There's a website hauntedhinsdalehouse.com. Is that still operative? Yeah, yep, that's still operating. Yep. And does that have photos or videos or anything like that? Uh, the link to the link to the Facebook page is right on there, so they can go to the Facebook page and look at all the photos on the site there. You mentioned that you, that first night, the, the live streaming, you stayed there, fell asleep on the couch. How often do you stay there? Or, or, you, you don't live there. It's not your primary residence, right? No, actually, I didn't fall asleep at the Hinsdale house. I was at my own home. Oh, I Watching see. the stream with everybody. Yeah, I mean, I, I, see. I actually try not to spend a lot of time there because it can be over overwhelming, you know. Uh, it, it gets to the point where you think about it a lot. 
and you, I want to be there, but I, I know in the back of my mind that I can't let it kind of overtake my whole life. I need to be able to have my personal space with it in order to continue what I'm doing there. So I actually have a lot of help from a lot of professionals, uh, other paranormal investigators, and we kind of rotate our duties there as far as like renovations go and as far as like allowing people to come in for a tour. It's all, it's all rotated so nobody gets overwhelmed with the place. So do you stay there? I mean, have you spent a few nights there uh, ever I by mean, yourself? Yeah. Or? Not really. Yeah, I had the last, the last time I spent the night there was in June. And it was for just a tour with two people. And they, they want, you know, they were local and they wanted to experience paranormal. You know, they wanted to see it with their own eyes. I'll tell you what, nothing happened the whole night. It was quiet. You know, it was like <clears throat> about 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, and, and the girl said, you know, I'm tired. And I said, okay, well, let's try to get some sleep. And I, said, well, okay. and I lay down on the couch in the living room. She lay down in the smaller couch in the corner of the one bedroom off the kitchen. And I felt something touch me. You know, like I, all these years I've been investigating, I, I probably think I've been maybe twice, two or three times. And I felt something brush the back of my head. Real lightly, nothing like, like, you know, hit me or scratch me, but it felt like somebody was pressing my head. And I turned over, and the shadow figure was going in front of, the only light that we had was a nightlight in the living room, and you could see the light blocking out. You could see the shadow figure. It was darker than dark. You could see it was, you know, it was blocking out the light, and I like, kicked Taylor, and I'm like, Taylor, the power. She turned over, and she freaked out and she goes, oh my god, you see that? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to verify that. And she jumped over on her couch and she's like freaking out. They kept going back and forth for like five minutes. And then it just dissipated near the wall. Like it yeah. didn't do, do anything to us. It just was there. And it just, we were actually able to visualize that. And I also, I think I have a camera in the living room. We were able to go back and view that footage and, and saw this apparition as we were sleeping on the couch. So, I mean, to be able to have that and collaborate what we're actually seeing with our own eyes is, is amazing. Well, I'm going to have to go to your website and look for that video. That's pretty cool. We're talking with Daniel Class, who owns one of the most haunted houses in North America, the Hinsdale House. When we come back, we'll open up the phone lines, see what's in your mind, and uh, continue the continue evil queen. We go into the break with John Fogarty, Evil Thing. <laughs> Thank you. 